I go to my iPhone. Hello, hello. I think we are live on Ustream. You guys out there? I have a chat window open. So it's 9.02 by my clock. And uh, I can see if you type in questions. So here's how this works. Um, you can't talk to me, but I can answer all your questions. So if you type in anything you want to know about Pilates, fitness, PT-based Pilates, exercise-based Pilates, um, I will chat freely about it. Um, I am here at the Como Shambhala Resort and Spa on Parrot Key, which is in the Turks and Caicos Islands. And we're using Ustream tonight. It's the first time I've used it. So uh, I'm new at this, and maybe you are too. If you have an account, you can actually ask questions, type them in. If you don't have an account, you can still listen and follow the chat, but you won't be able to, to actually ask questions. So um, go ahead and make a free account and delete it if you don't want to keep it after that. I have a list of questions <laughs> that have been sent to me, so I think my plan is going to be to just go through them. And if you have anything to add or... Um, supplement that information with. I'd love to hear it. If you have specific questions that you want answered, I am all ears tonight. Um, I am in a ridiculous place. This is possibly the most beautiful place on the planet, so I'm really happy to be here. The retreat is going phenomenally. We've had two full classes a day, and the resort actually has not only a few places to work out, but a full equipped Pilates studio. So in between our group classes at one or one of the pavilions or gazebos that we choose for the day, we also have the option of going and doing actual full uh, Pilates sessions. So let me just check on the stream and make sure that I'm not missing any of your questions. Um, here is a test. Yep, we are here. We're alive. It's working. Okay, so why don't I begin uh, with some questions that were sent to me about um, the Pilates Practice Companion, uh, which asks specific questions about specific exercises. The first one it, question is about the swan prep. Uh, and the question is, so often we're told it's not an arm exercise, maybe, but you cannot press your body up without most of the work going into the arms. I have always been confused. Okay, um, swan prep. Here's my feeling about the swan prep. Yeah, it's not an arm exercise. You take hands under the shoulders and you do bear weight to come up, but the ideal is that you come up as high as you can, supporting all the musculature in your abdominals and your back extensors, and that in a perfect world you should be able to release those hands from the floor, starting with just an intermittent release and then working up to a complete release so that ultimately becomes the full swan swinging back and forth. So yes, it's not an arm exercise. You may need the arms initially for beginners. Uh, the plan is to gradually build strength and stamina in the back muscles and of course in the abdominals to support that in order to not need the arms at all. So I hope that helps clear it up. Um, I like the swan prep. I actually don't always use that version with the hands. Sometimes I use Mr. Pilates' sort of original version, which just lays flat on the mat and starts from nothing, and you have to overcome the inertia of nothing, and then just use your muscular strength to actually get that seesaw motion in the body. Great exercise, really in my opinion, should be introduced much earlier than it typically is in the classical tradition. Extension exercises seem to come a little bit later on. I like to get them in a little bit early just because it helps to balance the body quicker and without sacrificing abdominal uh, control, of course, um, but very important to get that exercise in as quickly as you can. Let's take another question. Um, I have sidekicks. Okay, sidekicks. Sidekicks front. I have been trying 
for several years to establish who introduced all the sidekick variations taught today under the classical umbrella. Were they introduced by Ramana? My guess is yes. Okay. Um, hmm. You know, I wasn't there back when Mr. Pilates was making up all his exercises. Um, I was trained by Ramana, so I know all of the variations she taught us. Um, in my opinion, Mr. Pilates was in a building that had rehearsal studios for dancers. He created exercises based on the clients that came to him with specific needs. And as a result, he wanted to give them what they needed. Um, I have also heard it said that Ramana made up all of those dancer style exercises. I think it's more likely that Mr. Pilates actually gave them to her for her, for her career, for her abilities, for her needs. And as a result, she kept them in her program and then passed them on. In his book, though, in his book, Return to Life, he only shows the first sidekicks, and that's the front and back. And I tend to stick closer to that uh, and only give lots and lots of dancer variations if that's what the client or students are really looking for. In my opinion, though, that first sidekick, that one that he prescribed for the home exerciser in his book, uh, is the fundamental one and the most essential one. So as to the origins, can't say, um, but, you know, they're certainly valid and, and usable, you know, when you need them. I could talk all night. If you have other specific questions not related to the book, send them along. Uh, I'm going to go on to the next question. I have sent to me the mermaid. Uh, I ask myself, why do you find this exercise your favorite Pilates move? <laughs> That's a funny question. The mermaid is our is our logo, and um, and I do have an answer for you. Let me let me finish the rest of this question. Um, I have the greatest difficulty getting my knees stacked. In fact, I can't. So they are apart. Um, scanning through. Sometimes shown to bring the arms into a T balance position before switching, and I struggle to sit upright. With your years of experience as a phys physical therapist, what muscle groups do I need to work on to open up my hip area to allow me to do this exercise? Um, okay, uh, so starting from the beginning, why is it my favorite Pilates move? Oh my goodness, um, I think the mermaid demonstrates an equal balance of flexibility, of strength, of grace. It's a very uplifting exercise and, and when I see it visually, it captured the spirit of Pilates for me, this ability to hold strong in a complicated position, uh, but it, it reeks of elegance and so I chose it as a sort of stamp for our business. The story of how it came to be our logo is actually a funny one and has to do more with publishing than with the exercise, but I have been um, sort of uh, enamored of the move ever since. Um, uh, in terms of actually executing the exercise, many, many people can't stack their knees and feet and it is absolutely fine as an alternative to let the top or bottom leg come in front. Simpl usually the top leg will rest a little bit outside and to the front of the bottom leg. The goal, of course, is to stack the legs. I have found that it is a great help to, to use your hand to hook under the bottom ankle. I see a lot of people holding onto the top ankle, but if you reach around and hook onto the bottom ankle, you actually create a support system so that you can hold on and not just tip over <laughs> as the mermaid can, can let you do. Um, in terms of the transition, about coming to a T in between. Uh, there is a progression with the mermaid, beginning with just the stretch, coming up right, separating the arms into a T, going the other way, and any piece of those alternatives or those variations are all great and valid. Um, which exercises do you need to come upright from the T? The side muscles. <laughs> you need to strengthen, strengthen your abdominal wall, your core, and also your obliques. Um, so, ah, Lisa from Bermuda, hip flexor muscles. Uh, I also tend to revert to using them when I get tired doing the teaser. Any suggestions how to not revert to using them to getting me up there from the teaser? Um, hi, Lisa. Um, hip flexor muscles. Yeah, they're, you know, it's an interesting conundrum with Pilates and hip flexor muscles. Pilates teachers seem to be 
really loath to activate them. They do need to be activated. They're, they're short, thick muscles, um, and they travel on this uh, sort of oblique diagonal in your body. So they're responsible for a lot of movements we do, and I feel that sometimes in our Pilates workouts, we try so hard to shut them off that we can't activate them when we need to because they've just been, you know, eliminated from the equation. Um, try working what I call the negative. So instead of trying to get up there, and you wrote, I have to get up there, um, why not work from the top down? So start from sitting up take your teaser position and then just work the descent coming down bit by bit by bit soften your knees and then however you need to get up like sit on up go for the full extension be in your v hold the teaser and then just work the descent coming down 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 that way you're never on that full stretch you know pre-teaser kind of hundred position um, and see if that helps you get up a little bit higher um, and not grip in the hip flexors. You can also always keep your knees a little soft. It doesn't have to be a grippy quad exercise that you know tortures you the whole way up. Um, I have a question sent to me about the shoulder bridge. Uh, the shoulder bridge, it says uh, clearly that Mr. Pilates was influenced by yoga. Is it clearly established that this is the case? And do you know the inside story on this exercise? My back loves it. <laughs> I love the shoulder bridge too. Um, I, you know what? There is no concrete evidence that I'm aware of to establish Mr. Pilates' studies. Having said that, I know of two people who are collecting uh, a history on Mr. Pilates, and they are... Um, Siri Galliano and Stacy Redfield, both I think on opposite sort of paths for getting that information together. Um, as far as I know, Stacy has some information about what really truly influenced Mr. Pilates. And I have yet to convince her to come up to my studio and present that information, but I'm after her. So Stacy, if you're out there <laughs> listening, I want you to come to Real Pilates and present a workshop on your findings. I think it's fascinating and I want to know. Um, the legend that we see typed up all the time is that Mr. Pilates studied yoga and Eastern and Western medicine. I wasn't there. I'm not sure. I have to believe he was influenced by some of those things, particularly given my own background, and I've taken up a lot of Ashtanga yoga this year and seen a lot of parallels. Um, so I can't say for sure, historically speaking, if Mr. Pilates took the shoulder bridge from yoga, but given that even in his time, I'd say there are no new new exercises he was pulling from gymnastics and from all of the exercises that were abundant in those days, Eugene Sandow being a really big exercise uh, influencer of that period. Um, I think Mr. Pilates was really just kind of one of the guys running around inventing equipment. He just happened to take it to an extreme, pulling in all of these springs and making a huge line of equipment um, and then assembling a really comprehensive system that you know, was influenced by many different uh, modalities. So, yay for Joe. <laughs> Next question. The windmill. Ah, okay. Uh, the windmill. I did not know that this exercise was originally performed when using Mr. Pilates' invention, the breathicizer. So, is it a breathing exercise? Which, which of the many approaches to breathing do you teach classically? Oh my goodness, there's so much breathing. Okay, a um, couple of things about breathing, and this will vary from teacher to teacher. My approach to breathing is that it is an advanced layer of your practice, and that only when you have some understanding of the mechanics of the moves can you really begin to think about and bring in the breathing. Many teachers disagree and think that breathing should be the first thing you learn. I find it a little bit difficult for people to see Pilates and experience Pilates as a moving dynamic system when you begin with the breathing. So my approach has been always to deliver the breathing as one of the final layers and that is something that Ramada taught to me and I have remained true to that. That is not the case when the client comes in and really needs that that education and needs to learn the breathing. So I'm always guided by the client in front of me. The windmill exercise is the exercise when you're standing up and you um, would normally hold the breathicizer in front of you which is that um, medieval looking torture device that has a little 
fan and a straw. You take a deep breath in, you exhale, and you see how long you can spin the pinwheel around while you exhale, exhale, exhale. And the whole time you're rolling down and then you roll back up. It can be done without the breathizer, so you don't need it in order to execute the exercise. But the breathizer is great because it gives you a visual representation. You can really see how long you held your breath. Um, but Again, you don't need it. Just stand up, take a deep breath, start to exhale, and see how far down you can roll from the crown of your head all the way down while exhaling. And then you can increase that and work to extend your time uh, the longer you go. So that is the windmill, and that is the origins as I know it, and that is the device that you would need to execute it. I've only ever seen them produced by uh, Gratz and by... Um, Basil's company, Pilates Designs by Basil. So, but I'm sure someone else has them. I just haven't haven't seen them beyond that. Um, next question: Half roll up. Often this exercise is demonstrated with toes pointed. Oh, this is from Pilates Practice Companion. He says you have it demonstrated with feet flexed, which to me sort of simulates using the strap for the feet position on the high mat. That's exactly right. Is this the reason you work with the feet flexed in this exercise? Um, okay, so half roll up. Uh, I typically teach with legs apart, hip width, and feet flexed. I do that to anchor the feet, to give uh, the student something strong to press down into the mat with. Um, and also to simulate exactly what happens on the high mat with the strap. You, it is not wrong to do it with the toes pointed. You can choose what is appropriate for your body or for your client's body. It's just a choice that I have made for, um, for filming for that particular and for the masses because I find that sometimes uh, certain versions work better for more people than less. So when there are sort of general rules about how to deliver an exercise that work, I tend to put that in the book rather than another version. Okay. Um, how are we doing? Wow. There are a lot of questions here. Okay, mini bridge. Oh yes, mini bridge. This is um this I this is not a new exercise. I've seen this is, you know, sort of peppered all around the Pilates community. I've seen teachers on Pilates anytime teach it. I've seen uh, my staff teach it and um, it's just instead of a regular shoulder bridge, you keep your whole body straight on the mat, long from feet to head, and the only thing that lifts up is your bottom. So you actually do a little bit of extension early on. I like this exercise early on in your workout because we don't get to extension until kind of later, like after the saw is the first time we sometimes uh, get to extension. So it's nice to have something where you're lying on your back where you can still pop up, get your extensors working, use your glutes a little bit, Great exercise, very hard to execute with your legs completely straight uh, as an alternative. You can walk your feet in a little bit, bend your knees, dig your heels into the mat underneath you, and then rise up. Um, and I can demonstrate some of these things maybe uh, as a follow-up to this if everybody would like that. Going forward, I wish you guys could see it here. It's unbelievable. I've worked out on the balcony. I've worked out in the gazebo. Um, at one of the pools tomorrow, I'm, I'm actually going to film at one of the villas here on Parakey, which are completely ridiculous. It's, <laughs> it's really beyond paradise. It's sort of like you've actually died and gone to heaven. Um, let's see. Oh, neck pull. Yes, well, who doesn't want to know <laughs> about the neck pull? Let me finish this one and I'll get back to the chat feed. One of the exercises I have a lot of difficulty with, where does the hinge back piece come from? Um, have you ever tried and tested? Okay, so the question is, where does the hinge back piece come from in the neck pull? Um, you know, again, when we get into discussing origins of movements, it's hard to say what he may have been thinking. I can tell you my approach to the exercise. Um, Pilates, the mat work being completely focused on spinal articulation and segmental articulation. Um, the neck pull starts from a flat back and sort of asks the abdominals or requires the abdominals to load very strongly before heading into that spinal articulation. So 
I think of it for me, it's akin to the short box. So you do your flat back and sort of then bring the hug in right after that, like a combination of those two moves. And, and I really feel like they're, they're both in there. So I try to exaggerate the first flat back hinge part and then feed gradually into the rounding under part so that you really get a balance of both moves. And you can do the same. And the coming up, of course, you stay round. Um, but you can exaggerate both those positions on the reformer if you're also doing reformer work. I can't say again where the, you know, what Mr. Pilates was thinking. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that he uh, required your back to work or your abdominals to work when loaded in a, in a curled position, in a straight position, and in an extended position, and as, as is demonstrated in so many of the sequences, we go from round to flat to arched, um, always trying to recruit the core and to keep the body balanced. So um, if you think of the neck pull in terms of what comes before and what comes after, uh, which I do a lot, and, and this is the first time I'm saying this out loud, so it, it may likely be that what comes after shoulder bridge and you know things that are inverted that the neck pull is a prep for and typically that's true when i when i start to examine that i think oh of course that's why he started this way so with that flat hinging back he was probably thinking okay we're going to go on to shoulder bridge now we need to start to bring in some of that extension and not stay so round so that we overtax the muscles in the next exercise that sounds like the truth to me that's my official line Lisa's back. Lisa from Bermuda, me again. I have a weaker side. My right, do you recommend isolating exercises for the right in order to build up that side? I try to focus more on that side, tightening, scooping, but wonder if there's a better approach. Um, it depends why it's weaker. Uh, if there was an, an initial injury or it's just a sort of organic imbalance. Um, on the whole, when things are weaker due to an injury or some kind of pathology, I do try to focus on strengthening that side. Having said that, you know, your Pilates work, which may take one, two, or three hours um, a week, is not usually enough to counter an imbalance that you live with um, day to day. So those sorts of things need to be addressed throughout the day, throughout the week, so that when you come back to your next workout, you're not coming in the same way you were. It's, it's very hard to make big differences in a body with an imbalance in limited uh, workouts per week. It just it takes a long time. So what we build is the awareness and then hopefully give you some tools to use throughout the week so that you continue to strengthen on your own without needing the teacher and the equipment and all of that. Um, yes, I do think you should work on the weaker side. Make sure if this is a scoliosis, which it looks like it may be due to that you are working the correct side and you are, typically wherever there is a large what we call you know hump or a visible um, protrusion, um, that's not that's not typically the stronger side. That's not typically overdeveloped muscles and I can't see on the chat, but typically that's your weaker side simply because the muscles have had to course a longer distance around the skeleton, making them overstretched and weaker. And that is usually the side you want to strengthen, not the side that's overdeveloped. There seems to be a lot of confusion in some of the um, older, uh, more classically trained um, teachers. And as a PT, that's when I just sort of put my my physical therapist hat on to just explain that a little bit more. Um, I do, I do think you should work the weaker side. I do think you su you should stretch the other side, but I don't think you know one, two, or a couple of Pilates sessions a week will be enough to counter that. So doing little bits of things during the day, um, each day, <laughs> will have a much better result. Um, yes. Oh my goodness. T. Oh, Swan. Unusually demonstrated. This is another from one of the books. Typically, it is shown with the setup being hands under shoulders and push up into position with arms extended and then told to dive. Uh, so the question is, this that I, I demonstrated the swan unusually in uh, in one of the books. I like your setup position. I see. Okay, so in that particular book, we demonstrated the swan uh, from a dead stop. Yes, a dead stop. Uh, so overcoming inertia, which is a, 
a huge skill and a great thing to be doing. Um, Mr. Pilates' book is exactly like that. He starts from nothing and he balances on the belly, the arms and legs are up in the air, and he starts gradually going bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I actually find that version not just effective, but also safe. Uh, I find it safe because whoever's doing that exercise can only generate as much force as they have strength. So they pretty much can't go bigger than they have the ability to support. Whereas if you push up on your arms and then go flying, you're using all this momentum, not necessarily supported, your gut could still be hanging out. I think you're more likely to get injured with that version than you would be uh, overcoming inertia, starting with arms and legs in the air, head up, and just going teeter-totter, back and forth, gradually bigger, all the way bigger, as much as you can support in your own body. Um, so that's where I got it. I actually got it from him, and I'm sticking to that one because I love that variation. Um, rocking. What, do you keep the legs in parallel in rocking? I find my tens, my legs tend to open to about hip width when I do the exercise. Okay, good question. Um, I certainly cue to keep the legs in parallel. Um, they do open a bit, but there is a strong tendency to open the legs quite a bit when doing the rocker. Um, and that will just shorten your ITB, not necessarily shorten it, it just doesn't help it stretch. So keeping the legs behind you uh, is the best you can hope for to execute a bigger rock and also to keep maximum length in the muscles. Um, I do not teach it with the legs together in parallel. I just teach it with the legs in a line behind you. So not out here, but together behind you. So if that helps, uh, one other cue for the rocking is to not hold the tops of your feet, but to actually hold your ankles. So if you find that you're doing this exercise and you're pulling up on your arches, slide your hands down and take hold of your ankles so that you can get a better grip um, and better movement altogether. Um, what else is there? Side kicks, the rond de jambe. <laughs> it is said that Mr. Pilates never used a ballet term in his life. If so, it begs the question, who named this exercise and is it not just another name for big circles? <laughs> There's a lot of historians out there with questions. Um, yes, absolutely, sure, it's a name for big leg circles. Um, who named the exercise? I'm not sure, but I think it was, this question is bringing us right back into Mr. Pilates' original studio in the building with the dancer rehearsal studios and um, one of those that he clearly created to help the dancers who maybe were injured, who couldn't take class, but who still wanted to or needed to be able to execute certain moves with their bodies. So yeah, little circles, big circles, and anything in those ballet terms, and I have heard the same, that Mr. Pilates did not use ballet terms, but I would find that hard to believe. I, I think he was also very clever and uh, a good marketer, a great entrepreneur, even if he might not have realized his, the fruits of his labor in his lifetime, I do think that he was really ambitious and entrepreneurial. And Romana used to tell stories all the time of how people would call, the studio would be empty, and they would ask for appointments, and he would say, no, 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 we're very busy, and hang the phone up on them. And it really helped to create a buzz about the studio. Again, maybe not a buzz that he realized so fully in his lifetime, but certainly that has lasted for decades and decades. So... Um, he created that infomercial. Um, I find it hard to believe that he didn't cater on some level to the needs of his clients. He certainly made exercises for them, so if he never used the phrase rond de jambe, I'm not sure. But, you know, he was of German descent, so maybe he wasn't so big on the uh, <laughs> using French terminology. Next question. Teaser with a twist. This exercise is not one often taught. And I ask myself, why is it classical? Um, classical, I don't know. I don't even know what classical is anymore. If it's not in Mr. Bellotti's book, which I think is the only thing we have to go by <laughs> that we can guarantee is classical. Um, it's certainly a version that I learned. There were dozens of teaser versions as I learned them um, 
up at Drago's gym back in the day. Um, but we teach it a lot. I actually think it's one of the few oblique exercises we have, so I try to introduce it uh, quite regularly, but it's sitting up, the knees are bent, uh, and you extend one leg and then you sit up, teaser with one leg, adding a twist and going over the leg if, you have, if you're not familiar with the exercise. Um, but if you think about it, we have the crisscross, we have the saw. Um, there's not a lot of twisting exercises on the mat, so anytime I can get some rotation in there, I go for it. So that teaser with the one leg and the twist is a great place to, to execute some rotation. I recommend you try it. Um, Yes. So here are some things that came up in our retreat this week. There were a lot of questions about uh, the use of the spine and this idea that you could have your uh, lower back or lumbar sort of rounded and then your upper back fully extended with shoulder retraction um, and have basically reversed the curves of your spine. Um, and it came up when we were doing the standing footwork. And if you think about it, when you come down to your squat, uh, standing footwork style, and you're not sticking your tail out, you really do want your abdominals pulled in and under, but you don't want to pitch forward with your body as there's a strong tendency to do. So I have been cueing the group to retract the shoulders. That would bring that upper back, which has that normal sort of S curve, into a reverse curve and then in the lower back where you would have that that arch to make that somewhat rounded which reverses the whole thing and well there was a big uproar in the class like why would you reverse the natural curves of the spine and so I said you know what we should all go into the Pilates studio <laughs> right next door and do the kneeling knee stretches on the reformer so not the first one but the second one where you're in extension is a perfect place to experience that same thing your hands are fixed on the bar your upper back is in extension but you don't have your lower back fully in extension you actually have that slightly flexed so then it came up again but why but why but why and we should always have answers to the why if you're teaching from a list and you haven't asked yourself why you're giving this exercise or why you're doing this exercise or if you're working out and just want to know why this exercise comes next um, you should always have an answer for yourself to why ask a teacher or ask yourself um, to my mind Mr. Pilates was completely consumed with making the spine fluid and creating a mobile articulate spine that could go vertebrae or vertebrae, vertebrae uh, whichever way he wanted and there's that famous quote of um, if your spine is you know inflexibly stiff at 30 then you're old and if it's wonderfully flexible at 60 then you are young um, I think it's pretty clear that his position on a flexible spine meant that your spine could bend any which way so whether it's upside down in a back bend or scoop the other way in a hundred um, or somewhere in between or actually the reverse of all of those things if you can do one end and the other end in the other direction you ought to be able to execute a reversal of the natural curves momentarily or in certain exercises it's a great sort of barometer for how mobile your spine is um, I do think that there is a cause to be clear that you work the middle of your spine too. We get a little caught up in our Pilates work on the top of the back, opening and the bottom of the spine, rounding and sometimes lose the middle of the back. So make sure that in your practice you are working the entire spine <laughs> and not just the distal ends. Does that make sense? Yes. I have one more question here to pick from. Letter T. Uh, this is one of the exercises that seems to me to be several integrated exercises. This is about the letter T on the reformer, or you could also do it on the mat. Uh, it looks like the setup in Return to Life for Swan Dive, which we talked about earlier. Yes, that's how I swan dive. Uh, it also looks like the flight, or sometimes called the dart. Confusing for me. Can you explain the relationship, etc., please? Okay, uh, the letter T uh, is stolen <laughs> or borrowed from the reformer and is just an exercise that you are allowed to move off of the long box on the reformer and take to the mat because it can be done and transferred quite easily. It can be done with small weights or it can be done with bare hands. 
And yes, it looks like the setup for the swan dive. Uh, there are some minor differences. Your body, upper body, is not up quite so high. The arms out to the side are actually palms down towards the floor. Um, and then in executing the exercise, there's no seesaw motion. Uh, so related, but actually this is sort of the swan or the beginning of the swan as a prep uh, on the reformer. So it, it is intended to be used with some weight. It's intended to be used with um, resistance as opposed to the swan dive, which uses just the body weight on the mat. So when we transfer the letter T to the mat, and start with the arms outstretched. We're just using body weight. You can use some additional resistance, but it's sort of a stepping stone or a, a segue into doing it on the reformer or just a variation. If you'd like to add more extension into your workout, into your mat routine, it's a place to uh, insert another move. Um, so yeah, letter T, I'm a big fan. On the reformer, on the mat, with weights, without weights, um, whatever however which way you can work it in. So I will open the floor once more just in case there's any last minute questions. I have lots of things to say about the resort here. It's crazy beautiful. The retreat participants here are uh, incredible. Some are teachers, some are students. We have complete beginners. Um, I've also had a bunch of uh, people who were not initially signed up wandering in to take class, uh, as well as the staff here. The staff is incredible here. Um, if you didn't know, we have now uh, in, in New York City, Linda Lippin, who was actually the resident Pilates trainer here, who came back to New York and is now working at Real Pilates, so that's a real gift. Um, When's the next retreat and where? <laughs> Good question. I have two small children, <laughs> so I don't do too many retreats, and I have to balance my schedule between Pilates conferences and Pilates teacher training and then places like this, which sort of, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> are on the other side of the spectrum of training um, and are more consumer-driven than teacher driven. Uh, but you're right, there should be more of these. So I'll look into that. We are talking about next year here. Uh, and for the moment, that's, that's, uh, that's all I have on the retreat side. But the virtual retreat went really well. And maybe I'll do another um, broadcast like this, take a week and do a workout every, every day from my compound upstate. Uh, it's very beautiful up there and it would lend itself to a great online retreat. So if that's something you're interested in, let me know and I can start filming and filming away. It is getting on to 940, so I am going to duck out and get a good night's sleep because filming the next workout for the virtual retreat is tomorrow at 7 a.m. Uh, and I have a very full day here, so <laughs> thanks. We'll try to get some more of these on the calendar. Uh, everyone was so great. I know there are people who are listening and I have a lot of emails to get back to. So thank you so much for your questions. I really enjoy them and I don't get to answer them all. This is a great format to answer email questions, answer online questions, answer Facebook questions, and just, you know, do one quick hit. Um, I have recorded this, so uh, if you need an email sent to you with the recording, then uh, just shoot me an email and I will send it out. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. Have a really good night. <laughs> Take care.